about uh, automating the causal, causal inference pipeline from Vosilis uh, Microsoft Research. Take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, as you know, this is like I decided to switch the topic of my talk. Uh, the main reason was that the, the topic that I, I had chosen is a quite sort of by now old paper, and I thought of presenting a more uh, some more recent work that I'm uh, uh, that I think will present more opportunities for collaboration and some challenges that I find exciting. And so maybe this would bring up topics uh, that you know, if you're interested, come talk to me after after the talk. Um, so also at, that this was at the expense of presenting a more polished talk. So please excuse any roughness in the in the presentation. Um, so. Okay. So something, one thing that is a, um, sort of like a top of mind to me, uh, for me these days is that uh, we live in an era where it's so easy to use uh, machine learning. Almost every decision maker, any domain expert that has access to a data set uh, and an outcome of interest can construct a machine learning predictive model to predict the outcome from the variables that, uh, that they have. Um, and so there's all of these uh, sort of like infrastructure and all of these uh, uh, you know, software that uh, major uh, companies have developed where basically the advertisement is come with your data, drop it into our automobile system, and then you can predict. And the, you know, the ease of use of machine learning has led to also the ease of misuse, where especially with the advent of a lot of interpretability tools, many times people currently use the combination of automated machine learning and interpretability to uh, naively, uh, you know, interpret that as, as causal inference. So, for instance, one very widely used uh, interpretability tool out there is the SAP uh, method and the SAP library, where you train an arbitrary predictive model, you pass it through SAP, and for every variable, you get some direction of how that variable affects your prediction. And there's been even in, internal to Microsoft, or we've seen data science groups, uh, uh, you know, out, uh, external to Microsoft trying to use these numbers as being sort of the causal effect of the variable on the outcome of interest. And this also even led us to write a, you know, a blog post with the creator of the sub library to be cautious when you're, when you're doing that. But there's actually sort of like a good reason why people are using AutoML plus interpretability for causal inference and the new problems that they're, that they're faced in that you know, machine learning is able to handle much richer and much more complex data sets than what traditional causal inference techniques uh, have been developed for. And so if I come to you, to you with data that has a lot of variables or maybe unstructured variables, I might get you know a better you know lead to a better decision if I use an automated ML than using like a linear regression or any other you know causal inference approach that is going to make many simplifying assumptions. And this has led to the uh, the flourishing of this uh, combination of causal inference and machine learning, this causal machine learning tool that tries to combine estimation approaches from machine learning and uh, and uh, and sort of like the causal inference pipeline to lead to um, sort of causal machine learning tools that will allow you to make decisions even with such uh, high dimensional complex data. But uh, another big hurdle is that most of these causal machine learning uh, technologies focus particularly on the sort of like estimation part or the inference part of the causal inference pipeline. Um, but uh, unlike predictive modeling, if we wanna make this causal inference accessible to any decision maker out there, there's so many other components to the causal inference pipeline that we also need to automate. When we're trying to do predictive modeling, there are basically three components, three steps. You collect your data, you do some estimation, some training, and then you keep some out of sample validation and you validate on that sample. And maybe now you even have, you know, maybe an interpret interpretability component at the end to try to understand what did the model learn to predict. When you're trying to do causal modeling, there are some key aspects that are rendering this pipeline. Uh, which we cannot ignore. One of them being the domain assumption elicitation. Uh, it is you know, quintessential to be in order to perform uh, sort of uh, causal inference that we elicit assumptions from domain experts of what relationships are correlated with what, and if there are like unobserved confounders and, and other uh, you know, like assumptions that we do not, that the data cannot tell us. Um, Moreover, when we're going to interpretability, now it's just not just interpreting what the model learned, but also what policy recommendations can we give to the uh, to the decision maker. Moreover, now you know since we our, our conclusions are based on these assumptions from the domain experts, we also want to do sensitivity analysis: how our conclusions are changing to violations of those assumptions. And because you know there's no perfect analog of out of sample validation for causal inference, it's also very critical that our estimation also comes with some form of uh, uncertainty quantification. And finally, exactly because there's no perfect analog of 
out of sample validation for causal inference, the ultimate you know, like, uh, analog is uh, active data collection, so experimentation. Okay? So really the causal inference pipeline is this loop where you have data, you elicit assumptions, you devise some identification strategy, then you do your estimation and your inference. Maybe you do some validation given the assumptions. If you wanna do model selection, uh, you recommend some policies, you perform some sensitivity analysis of how these policies would change if those assumptions are violated. And maybe then you also recommend to the decision maker to run some experiment that will uh, better inform the conclusions, right? So these are all of the components that we need to automate if we really we need to, to move to a, a, an automated causal machine learning system in the same manner that uh, currently are people, people are using the automated machine learning systems. And I guess my point is that a lot of the um, uh, focus has been around these components, uh, but there's also so many other challenges that we need to address if we want to make uh, causal inference accessible to any decision maker. The other thing is that I believe that, you know, like unlike machine learning and predictive modeling, for causal inference, we cannot really exclude the human in the loop from this pipeline. There are actually the one crucial step where I believe we'll always have a human in the loop is in the assumption elicitation. And another step where in most applications we'll have a human in the loop is the, in the implementation of the experiment. Right? Maybe in, in cases where in digital experimentation where it's not high stakes, maybe there we could have a, a automated experimentation, but in most critical scenarios, someone will need to look at the experiment you wanna run and vet it and see that it's something that it's actually feasible to run due to maybe safety constraints, ethical constraints, fairness constraints. And so all of these, there are all of these open challenges that sort of like I'm, uh, I'm very excited about thinking in the future uh, that the estimation and inference is only a small part of this whole uh, automation. Um, some of them have been more addressed than others. Um, for instance, um, you know, as I said, uh, identification strategies we have, you know, based on causal graphs, generic identification strategies, but, you know, for instance, incorporating non-graphical restrictions. I have not found like a generic approach where I give you a causal graph and also several other restrictions, then you automatically give me an identification strategy. Um, or, you know, um, there's been some, uh, you know, like uh, experimental validation and some theoretical work on uh, proxies for, causal, for good losses for causal modeling and uh, some work on uh, policy recommendations, but less about uh, these other quantities over here. For instance, I think one very underexplored area is how do we elicit assumptions from the domain experts? Um, the current approach is out there is basically ask the domain expert to give you a causal graph. But if I have like even 30 variables or 20 variables, you know, like the cognitive burden of, of providing a causal graph for all of those variables is so large that many people will just not use causal inference just because you ask them to define a causal graph. But for many causal questions, it's not even needed to define the, the whole causal graph in order to, to devise an identification strategy. So one question is, you know, can we devise interactive, you know, like elicitation protocols where we elicit the minimal amount of information that we need in order to uh, come up with an identification strategy. Um, and uh, another, you know, like a topic that I'm, I'll talk a bit more extensively uh, in this talk is, uh, the fact that once you start automating some pipeline, uh, you also start having problems with the uh, cleanliness of your data. So if someone comes with an arbitrary data set to you and drops it into your, your, your pipeline, most of those data sets will be corrupted in some manner. Um, if you're in a critical scenario, maybe those data sets will be corrupted in an adversarial manner. So we also need to think very carefully about robustness to data corruption and maybe adversarial attacks when we, within the causal inference pipeline. Um, and another topic that I'll talk about today, which is sort of more developed, is how do we automate the inference? How do we automate a bit the inference uh, process when we use machine learning for the estimation part? So I won't talk any about any of these other challenges, but if you're interested in any in collaborating in any of these, please uh, talk to me afterwards. So in the interest of presenting something more technical, I'll focus on uh, some recent work that we did on robustness uh, and uh, uh, causal inference and automated debiasing uh, in causal inference. Any questions?
So the first part is uh, it's based on uh, a recent work that we did with uh, Drew Brohatki, who is a student, uh, a PhD student at MIT. And it's about this topic of how do we fend against uh, corruption, adversarial corruption uh, in our data sets when we're uh, doing some causal estimation. <laughs> and um, our goal uh, is to uh, perform automated and theoretically grounded outlier removal that can, lead with, that can deal with corrupted data, for instance, maybe to poor data collection or adversarial attacks. Um, and also mitigate a bit the problem of drawing conclusions from small fractions of your data. Uh, there's been some very recent, uh, very interesting work recently uh, that showed that many of the conclusions from high profile, for instance, uh, empirical economics papers uh, could be reverted if you solely remove or change a bit some small fraction of your data, right? And so your conclusions are very sensitive to the small fraction of your data. Right? If you use some of the classical approaches in causal estimation, and so this motivated us to study uh, uh, causal estimation within the strong contamination model, which is a very strong notion of corruption, but allows you to, uh, you know, like fend against these types of, of problems. So what is a strong contamination model? It basically says you have samples drawn IAD, but then an adversary comes and arbitrarily alters an epsilon fraction of the samples in an arbitrary manner. And what are the good, you know, the, what, what we want from uh, robust estimators uh, is that, first of all, they're computationally tractable. Um, they're robust to a constant fraction of outliers, so not just asymptotic uh, theorems as epsilon goes to zero. And that we get some quantitative finite error uh, guarantees without dimension uh, dependence as for any epsilon and for any sample size. Uh, a lot of these are not achieved by the more classical work in robust statistics. But there has been a, 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 you know, um, a very rich li recent literature in the computational learning theory community that tries to address all of these desiderata for problems such as mean and covariance estimation, linear regression, and risk minimization. And so the goal of our work, of our work is to study a much more general framework that would encompass causal estimation. And that framework is the framework of estimating parameters defined via conditional, via, sorry, via moment restrictions. So many causal estimation problems can be formed as finding a parameter that satisfies some moment condition, which looks like if I take an expectation of my data coming from the, the distribution, this moment vector G has to be equal to zero when evaluated at the truth theta. And you know, one concrete example is linear regression, where this is the implicit moment when you do square loss minimization. And another prominent example is instrumental variable regression, which is basically the same as linear regression, but instead of multiplying by the thing that you're regressing on, you multiply by the instrument. So even though you know, linear regression, you can formulate it as risk minimization, and then you could apply prior techniques in the computational learning theory community, IV regression doesn't fall into that, uh, that class of problems, but falls into this larger class of moment problems. So our goal was to adapt those techniques so that we have sort of like this desiderata for uh, the setting of uh, generalized method of moment estimation. So when you have this method of moment, when you have this moment conditions, the, the one standard estimator that you're trying to minimize some reweighted violation of your, of your moment. So some norm of your, of your, of your moment restrictions. So even though this uh, general me methods of moment estimator uh, for some appropriate choice of the weighting matrix is statistically efficient and also can be implemented uh, under further conditions in a computationally efficient manner, it's not outlier robust. And many of, for, for instance, of the examples that uh, that uh, that paper was showing was examples where the estimation was happening through a GMM estimation. So our results are basically the following at the high level. We provide a robustified GMM algorithm, which achieves recovery error that scales with root of the epsilon fraction in the epsilon strong contamination model 
for any for any constant epsilon that is small enough but not going to zero and such that our algorithm is poly, runs in polynomial time and has polynomial sample complexity and to achieve that we will need some conditions on our mo on our uh, moments which are sort of like regularity conditions you know the, the parameters should be strongly identified by the moments not just weakly the uh, there should be bounded variants uh, in the noise and the grading of the moments um, uh, your without the epsilon corruption you should be well specified so your moments should be holding and the moments should be should satisfy some Lipschitz condition with respect to the uh, parameter okay. Um, is there any condition that this kind of um, the the moment function that you're trying to mit, to min to minimize that it is like con convex in the in the data? Uh, there's no uh, such assumption, but it, it closely related to the strong identification. Uh, it will also alter whether you know you can solve the GMM problem efficiently or not. For the prominent example, it would be you know like the moment would be linear in theta, and then you get. Uh, but yeah, so sometimes you know it, the strong identifiability sometimes is coupled with computational efficiency, but not generically, like in the general moment problem. And in fact, you know, in the general moment problem, you're actually trying to find the, the critical point of the norm, right? So you don't really need to minimize the norm of the violation because the critical point is a point where where the moments will be satisfied. So that suffices. So you know, you can either do like critical point. Yeah. What does that What does that mean then? Would that well, I guess our, our, if you're going to tell us about strong identifiability, then I'll wait to ask that. I'll, I'll say it in the context of the IV example. Yeah. Like the strong identifiability also uh, allows us to argue robustness. So it's not just about computation, but allows us to argue robustness. And we'll enter into our robustness rates. Our theorem is like a two part theorem. First, we prove we show some uh, recovery bounds uh, for general moment condition problems, assuming that the empirical distribution of the samples, of, of the true samples, not the corrupted samples, satisfies all of those conditions. And then we show that for particular applications that are uh, uh, very uh, popular applications of the, G of the GMM framework, such as IV regression and some nonlinear version of I regression those assumptions are satisfied with high probability um, under population level assumptions. Right? So how does our algorithm look like? It's basically a filtering algorithm and it's based on uh, a, re a recent work in the, in the cold community uh, but that's, uh, that's called the sever algorithm, which was applied to loss minimization, to risk minimization. Uh, so the basic idea behind these uh, filtering approaches uh, is the following. If you have two distributions um, that are uh, uh, within a small, within an epsilon TV distance with each other, and that holds between the uncorrupted and the corrupted because we can only uh, corrupt epsilon fraction of the samples, then for any such epsilon close to uh, random variables, either uh, their covariance operators should be large, or otherwise their mean is small within that, within that bound. So either you're good enough because you care about means and you don't need to filter anything, or if you're not good enough and you need to filter some things, you, you're gonna need to filter, you, you know, there's an evidence here. It says, you know, like the things that you need to filter have a large covariance in some direction. Yeah. So, right, so it must be that if this difference in means that you care about is large, uh, then it must be that uh, because you need to filter, you need to filter out stuff, then that stuff that you need to filter will have some uh, large covariance in some direction of the covariance operator. And so what the filtering algorithm does basically says, you know, so you're given some target initial set of samples that you believe are uncorrupted. You're going to calculate the empirical covariance of those samples. Right? You're going to find the largest angular vector of those samples. And then you're going to look for every sample what is the projection of that vector on that largest eigenvector. vector. And you're going to try to cut off points that have a very large absolute value of that projection. Right? Things that have a large projection on that largest eigenvector, vector, you're going to cut off. 
if it happens that you don't, that there are not many things that are sort of outliers in that direction, you don't cut off anything. And this, uh, you know, like uh, intuition here is going to give you that, that your means are close to each other. So that's the basic intuition behind filtering. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply this intuition to the GMM problem. Uh, our algorithm is similar to the sever problem for risk minimization, but has an extra step because now our loss, which is this GMM loss, is not just an empirical risk. It's the norm of some vector of empirical uh, moments. And so we're going to need sort of two filtering steps. One that tries to filter the Jacobian of the, of the, of the moments, and another that tries to filter the moments themselves. Okay. So I have a question about this, this uh, filtering, um, which is probably more general, like about the technique. But it seems like I'm filtering based only on the second moments. But the corruption, I could do any kind of wacky thing. So what's kind of the intuition that the second moments are enough to detect corruption? You're assuming that your true data has, has bounded say, second moments, but some bound on the covariance of the true data. And that's why it allows you to detect the... Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. So if I... Okay. So you're you're going to make assumptions that this, the true, has it bounded by sigma, and then you're going to... Yeah. So this is the you know the, the difference between this concrete algorithm and, and the prior work for risk minimization. We need two filtering steps, but the, the you know the uh, and in the end with these two filtering steps we can show uh, our general meta theorem. And then we can apply it to, for instance, the IV regression. The concrete assumptions that we're going to need for IV regression is first that the instruments are valid. Um, you know when you subtract the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the uh, outcome from the causal effect, the residual is going to be mean zero, condition on the instrument. These noise, th these uh, residuals should have bounded variance. Uh, this is the strong instrument uh, assumption that the sort of covariance between the instrument and the treatment uh, should be lower bounded by some lambda in terms of minimum making value. Uh, the covariance of the instrument and the treatment should be upper bounded by some uh, L. Uh, we need some assumption between the L4 and the L2 moment of those random variables, which is typical in this literature and called the 4-2 hypercontractivity. And another more benign assumption on the bounded large moments. And subject to all of these assumptions, we can get a rate that scales with root epsilon. And over here, you're going to get constants that depend on, on the bounds on the variance that you assume the, uh, and uh, the strength of the instrument. Right? Um, and the algorithm that, that's going to come out of the general uh, purpose machinery is also going to be polynomial uh, time in terms of computation. So that is one of our main results in this, in this paper. And then we also try to see how it performs in practice compared to more uh, existing techniques for uh, doing robust statistics uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of IV regression. Uh, so here we looked at, for example, the case of trying to estimate heterogeneous treatment effects with instruments. And for simplicity, you make a, a linear heterogeneity assumption that your heterogeneity is linear in, in the covariates that you have. And then it becomes really a linear IV regression problem where the number of moments that you have corresponds to the number of variables that you have uh, plus one. Um, so these are the moment restrictions. We do a synthetic experiment where we have 20 such uh, characteristics. 10,000 samples, and we scale the corruption over here. This is what our uh, GMM sever algorithm would, would get as an estimation error, L2 recovery error. Another prominent prior work from the 80s in, in the context of IV regression, and more recently was also, uh, uh, there were, there, there's been some more recent work on it, is to view IV as a two-stage uh, linear regression, which is one uh, standard approach. And instead of running two-stage linear regression, you do you run two-stage robust regression, so Haber regression. And we see that this two-stage Haber regression is also very sensitive to this epsilon contamination. Most of the results in that literature are only asymptotic as epsilon goes to, uh, to zero and provide uh, guarantees that as epsilon goes to zero, you get consistency, but there's no finite epsilon guarantee. And also the vanilla IV error would also be very large. Another experiment that we run was a more uh, semi-synthetic experiment where we take this very classical data in uh, labor economics on that studies the, uh, the effect of education on wages. Um, 
And there we, we took that data set and basically added corrupted data to that data set and, and try to see how standard IV uh, regression would perform and how our GMM uh, uh, server regression would perform. We actually did a corruption where if you uh, carefully, you know, we did a sort of like an adversarial attack where the standard IV would, would negate the effect of the, uh, uh, of the treatment if you, start, if you apply standard IV, but our GMM server would, would predict a, an effect which matches the, uh, the effect on the uncorrupted data if you were to run IV on the uncorrupted data. Right. So uh, this is a more like, you know, empirical application that even though there, there's a, there were a lot of constants in the theorem, it actually works well in practice and, and better than other approaches to robust estimation. So that was what I wanted to say about this, uh, this, uh, this result. And one major open question that I believe uh, uh, arises is how do we do inference when we're trying also to fend against such outliers? So here you have a lot of filtering through your algorithm and that will definitely alter the distributional properties of your estimator. And so how can we provide confidence interval if we do these filtering steps? Um, and this is you know, like a generic problem when you know, typically these filtering steps are done by a data scientist or a statistician who tries to clean up the data and, and, um, and find outliers. And I guess the, the point of this work is that we need to automate that, even that process. And once we automate that process through some algorithm, maybe we can also automate the inference process afterwards, given that we know uh, how you're filtering your data to fend against outliers. Um, so that was that, uh, that part. The other part I wanted to talk about uh, briefly is about automated debiasing of generic machine learning with generic machine learning. And this is joint work with uh, Victor Chernozukov, Whitney Nui, uh, Rahu, and uh, Victor Quintas Martinez, all from MIT. And this again deals with uh, you know, moment estimation problems. Uh, but now, apart from the more classical uh, moment estimation conditions that, uh, that I was talking to in the previous vignette, here uh, we're also going to add an extra component to our moment conditions. We're going to add these nuisance functions. We're going to add the uh, functions that we need to estimate from data, but uh, we don't really care about. Uh, and many problems in causal inference boil down to estimation problems that look like that, where you also have a nuisance component. Even in our previous uh, section, you know, we had the coefficient theta that was in front of the treatment, but we also had the offset beta that we needed to estimate. And for instance, some leading examples, when you're trying to estimate average treatment effects, uh, to estimate the average treatment effect, you need to estimate this big regression problem where you want to regress your outcome on the treatment and all of the observable confounders. And if those are, are many confounders, this is a very hard regression problem. Uh, but you don't really care about the uh, regression problem. What you care about is the average of these uh, contrasts. Uh, or average policy effect where you, know, you are going to treat or not treat people based on some uh, candidate policy and your goal is to estimate is what is the value of that policy. Or the average derivative when you have a continuous treatment like a dose or a price uh, where you want to estimate the average marginal effect of that price and expectation over the treatments that you observed in the data. Now, because many times we're faced with hard regression problems over here, you might want to use machine learning to estimate those regression functions, uh, but machine learning will lead to regularized and biased estimates. And so naively plugging in those estimates into uh, these equations will lead to non-asymptotically robust and uh, non-asymptotically non normal and also non-robust uh, uh, estimates of the target parameters that you care about. And this has been a large body of, of, of work in the um, in the semi-parametric inference literature of how we uh, uh, sort of like uh, reduce uh, that um, uh, error from those nuisance components and how do we get uh, confidence intervals and inference despite using machine learning for those uh, components. And the high level intuition is that instead of doing a plugin uh, approach to your original moments, you're going to debias your moments. So you're gonna add a debiasing term to your moments that uh, will relate to the bias of your regression function. Right? So say for instance, for simplicity now that our moments have a very special form that the parameter we care about is the expected value of some moment function 
that depends on a regression uh, function. All of the moments that we uh, uh, present in the previous slide fall into this category. And that this function is, is in the form of some regression, y conditional on x. Then, you know, like one result in the semi-parametric inference literature that the debiased version of that moment condition is of the, of the following form. Uh, oh, so this would be a plus here. Um, add to your original moment some function of x and the residual of the g that you estimated with the target thing that it wants to predict. So if your uh, g was biased, then this residual over here would not be mean zero. And so you would be adding a bias term to your moment condition. And then the main question is, what is this a of x? What function should we add here in order to still estimate the same quantity theta over here and in order to really achieve the biasing of our original moment? And the function that you need to put in here is what is known as the risk representer of this linear functional. So if your moment is linear in g, then this expectation over here is a linear functional of G. And every linear functional subject to regularity conditions is going to have an inner product representation. So it's going to have a, a representation of this form for some function A. And this is called the Ries representer theorem. And the function that you need to put in here is exactly the Ries representer that comes out of the Ries representer theorem. Okay. The traditional approach to debiasing has been characterized what the risk representer looks like for the target moment that you care about. And then once you see how it looks like, maybe it corresponds to estimating some other nuisance function like a propensity uh, or a density, uh, and then estimate that and plug it in your risk and, and debias. So that's the more traditional approach to debiasing. And, you know, like for instance, you know, for the average treatment effect, you can show that this is the risk representer, which leads to the doubly robust estimator, uh, where P here is the propensity, the probability of that the treatment takes value equals one. Uh, for average policy effect, it's a similar sort of like inverse propensity uh, quantity. And for the average derivative is uh, the derivative of the log of the density of the treatment conditional on the confounders. And so one uh, line of work in the, in the recent years, uh, pioneered by this paper of Chernozukov, Newey, and Singh, and also Smackler, Rotnitsky, and Robbins, is whether we can circumvent this characterization and uh, directly estimate A, simply having some oracle access to the moment. And you can see how that is useful when trying to think broadly in this automating the causal inference pipeline, in that if our moment comes in some sort of black box manner from some identification algorithm, we don't want to every time go in there and do some analytical calculation and define what the risk representer is and debias it. If we only, if we could only, you know, calculate what this represent this representer is, just you having oracle access to the moment, it will be very useful in automating the whole pipeline. Can I ask? Oh, on the last slide. So I've I've seen this uh, technique before from the from the previous one. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, yes, the, the, the debiased mo mo moment. But can you remind me, is the reason that we do this to get uh, these doubly robust rates, is this the main reason or are there yeah. other reasons that we do That's this? That's the main well? reason, yeah. To get like, you can, uh, so once you debias, you get that the error of G enters in a second order term. Uh, in, in this situation, you can even get that uh, it's the product of A and G that matters, of the error of A and G that matters. So that's, yeah, that's the reason. But you know, yeah. Yeah, I just want to make sure I was on the same page. Okay, thanks. And so that was, but then that prior work was focusing on particular types of representations for that risk representing, particular linear representations where you have some sieve and you do some L1 penalized uh, estimation for the risk representer. And so the motivation of this work was can we use generic machine learning for uh, learning that risk representer and not just the uh, sieves, right? uh, not just the uh, linear representations. Uh, so first, you know, like one paper that we wrote on this generic uh, estimation approach was the adversarial approach, where basically, you know, we know that our risk representative needs to satisfy this continuum of moment restrictions, that for any test function G, your moment needs to be equal to this uh, inner product. And so you can go from that to an adversarial loss, where if you have a candidate risk representative, you can try to maximize the moment violation, penalizing some uh, second moment of the test function. And this will still be identifying your risk representer. And so here you, you just need Oracle access to your moment M 
And you know, just solely of that, solely using that, you can uh, if you solve the min max problem over some function class A and some function class G, you can get the, the risk representer. And that in that paper, we showed how this estimator that comes out of this min max uh, approach achieves uh, estimation rates for the risk representer that scale with what's known as the critical radius of the function classes, which is a tight measure of complexity for that was being studied for square losses. And here we also apply it to this min type of min max losses. And what is RG and RA? These are penal penalizations. So typically this would be the norm of G and the norm of A squared for some definition of a norm. And these penalizations will allow you also to not just scale with a critical radius, but also with the norm of the true risk representer, which is unknown. So if, if you don't have those, you can still get quantities, but we'll have a worst case norm dependence in the leading term. If you add penalizations, then you'll, you'll scale automatically with the norm of the true risk representer. So that was you know, the first paper we wrote on generic ML for the risk representer. Okay. I have a question with um, uh, not following some people. I don't understand why is it min respect to A and matches with the G? G, should I be trying to minimize the So G is like, think of it as a symmetric. So without those of generality, if you find the G that this thing, this violation is negative, you could also do the minus G and it's positive. So think of this as the mo maximizing the moment violation. And you want to find the A that minimizes the maximum moment violation. Okay. So good. that was one result. Later, actually, we also found a new you could uh, you don't need the min max uh, uh, approach to the generic uh, machine learning that you can also find uh, so that the risk representer is a minimizer of the following loss where you uh, take the uh, square of the risk representer subtract two times the uh, the moment and the intuition is that basically at in the population limit this quantity over here is just going to be the product and so by completing the square the loss that you're actually minimizing in the population limit is equal to the mean squared error loss with respect to the unknown A naught. So even though you don't know what A naught is, by minimizing this loss, you're essentially minimizing the mean squared error uh, in the population limit with respect to that A naught. And so you can also show similar critical radius results for arbitrary function classes by minimizing this, uh, this loss function over here. Now, relation between the two, I still like, uh, haven't found like the concrete, which one is better to do in practice. They give uh, com comparable results. Uh, one argument in favor of the adversarial approach is that it really tries to minimize the moment violation, which is what enters into your bias component when you analyze the error. So directly targets the bias of your final estimator. But on the other hand, it's computationally much more, uh, much harder to uh, to solve. And so you know this is simpler, but uh, maybe you'll get a lower bias with the adversarial estimator. But uh, we haven't run extensive experiments to understand whether the finite sample differences of the two approaches. And so here, for instance, this is an example theorem that we get for the, this loss minimization approach, uh, where you know, one key property that I didn't mention thus far is that we need the moment uh, function to satisfy what's known as mean squared continuity. So it's a form of continuity of your moment function, but it's slightly stronger than being continuous with respect to the, uh, the nuisance parameter. It has to be mean squared continuous. And many examples satisfy this, but that's one key regularity property that we need. And solely based on this property, we can get uh, the rate where you know, the leading term is this critical radius. And this is just the bias if you're optimizing over a space of functions that do not contain the true risk representer. And we can also go beyond linear models where you know, instead of subtracting this risk representer for the moment, you first take the derivative of the nonlinear moment with respect to the nuisance and then apply the risk theorem to that and then uh, uh, add a, a biasing term, but this will satisfy similar debiasing properties, but uh, weaker. So it's gonna be a locally debiased moment. Um, and then, by the way, how much time do I have? Do I have like uh, two minutes or? Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. So you can even go beyond uh, linear moments and achieve sort of like a, a val asymptotically valid inference with generic ML. And then we also try to uh, implement uh, those approaches with neural networks and random forests. Uh, and one uh, sort of like more heuristic uh, improvement that, that we found when implementing that, uh, which led to uh, uh, another work where we really uh, you know, dive into this uh, uh, heuristic improvement is applying multitasking. 
where now since our risk representer is the minimization of this loss, maybe we can jointly train for the risk representer and the uh, uh, regression problem and learn representations that uh, are good for both uh, of, those regression, of, of those functions that we're trying to learn. And the intuition is that you know, essentially if you're uh, trying to solve such a mo uh, moment problem, uh, you really don't need to control for all of the confounders. You only need to control for the uh, risk representer in order to be unbiased. So as long as you're controlling for the risk representer, you're gonna get an unbiased uh, estimate, but you know, of course, controlling explicitly for all the rest might, will lead you to a, a better, a more efficient, a more a lower variance estimate. But just from the purpose of unbiased, you just need to control for the risk representer. And so as long as you have a good representation that can represent the risk representer, and that's what goes into your regression function, that's still good enough for getting an unbiased uh, final estimate. And so you can think, for instance, training a neural net where you have some initial representation layers that spit out the risk representer that minimizes this loss. And then also that same representation goes into a regression uh, loss. And this is what we applied both for uh, uh, neural nets and random forests, where for random forests, you can couple the tree structure and we get sort of like better performance in some classical benchmark data sets like this infant health development program that even beats the plugin estimation approach where you explicitly know there is represented in a plug it in, you can get even better results with our direct sort of like risk estimation uh, framework. So that's that. And with that, uh, you know, we also apply to some real data there. We don't see big differences between the different methods, whether you do the adversarial, the non-adversarial, the plugin or not plugin, the estimates that you get, uh, for instance, in a, another prominent example that many people use, which is the 401k example on the eligibility on, on net financial assets over, uh, on 401k eligibility on financial assets over the horizon of about two years. So this sort of goes maybe more to the stability that, uh, that uh, Bin Yu uh, wants that all of these things are giving the similar uh, <laughs> effects. So maybe this is the right effect over here. And similarly, we applied it to another uh, 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 application where the, the treatment is continuous and then we have to deal with this much more complex average derivative uh, estimation. Uh, another open question over here that I think is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is interesting is going beyond regression nuisance functions and general causal graphs and doing automated debiasing for general causal graphs. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the great talk. Could you go back once, like to the last open problem you have? Like, what what do you mean here? Uh, with general causal graphs more than the angle interaction? Do you need like a bit of density or something? Yeah. So if you have like a, say you know like a continuous uh, variable and a general causal graph, and you do some identification strategy where which depends on uh, on some regression problems, then does it always fit in our in, the, in our current framework? I'm not sure. For instance, if you go to the dynamic treatment regime, that's a concrete uh, setting where I don't know where our current techniques do not handle it. So if you have like some identification strategy for the dynamic regime, then uh, you might, you know, like uh, that needs more, more work on automated bias. So, but what, okay, but I, can, can, do you have an example of like a simple problem that uses some a nuisance function that is a regression, like a density ratio or something? Uh, okay, the one problem example would be if it's like a nested regression function. So the regression function is, a, it depends on another regression function, it depends on another regression function. You mean like the G computation? Yes, like in G computation. Yeah. So if you have a G formula with a nested uh, set of regressions, then, you know, Got it. That's a very concrete <laughs> open question. That, uh, okay, got yeah. it. <laughs> Any? Can you generalize to the case estimation? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have, <laughs> yeah, uh, so yes, so you can apply this risk representer formulation, and then instead of like, uh, you know, like uh, finding the average of this, subtract some theta of x and minimize the square loss. And that would lead to what I was going to talk about in the prior uh, presentation of orthogonal statistical learning. This would be an orthogonal loss, and you'll get second order effects from the, your risk representer and your G on the estimation of the K estimate, similar to how you get for like the DR learner. Uh, this would be a generalization of the DR learner. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you compare your X with the double robotic X and there's some other small asymptotic equations or something. So the, asymptotically they are the same. It's more like, uh, do you get like a better error by directly minimizing the square loss for the risk versus minimizing say the logistic loss and then plugging in? So I think that would be the difference. And you, you see that uh, 
difference in performance here where this we saw the random forest classifier we plug it in we get a mean squared error that is huge and if you do like a double bus with our reserve presenter you get a much smaller in this semi-synthetic experiment so it's a better maybe loss function for training your classifier all right let's thank the speaker one more time